What are some of the top line, most important lifestyle protocols or interventions that you recommend when your patients come through and you see something lighting up or not lighting up in these scans and, and realize that there's work that can be done to course correct? So it depends on your brain. I mean, you know, there are things everybody should do, like love your brain. And I horrified myself, I don't know, I guess about 10 years ago when I went, brain health is three things. Brain envy, got to care about it. Nobody cares about their brain. Why? Because you can't see it. We don't it. see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly, and you can do something when you're unhappy with it. I also think we're just not taught to care for it. It's not, not something that we think about. We know we should eat better and all the like, and we know we can learn things with our brain, but there isn't a broad sense that we can improve our brain health through certain lifestyle choices that we're making. Immediately, your brain's worse if you're drinking alcohol or if you're smoking pot. Immediately, your brain's worse if you don't prioritize sleep if you eat crappy food. You know, going back to these 11 major risk factors, but it's three things, brain envy. So when I started 1991, I scanned everybody I knew. I'm like so excited. And uh, I scanned my mom, she was 60. She had a beautiful brain, which really reflected her life. She has seven children. 54 grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Wow. She knows everybody, still 92. She knows everybody's name. She knows what's going on in their lives. And she's just someone that she brings people to her. I scanned myself a week later, and it wasn't nearly as good as my 60-year-old mother, and that just irritated me. But I played football in high school. I had meningitis twice as a young soldier, bad for the brain. And I had bad habits. You know, I never drank, I never smoked, but I wasn't sleeping. I thought I was special, like I could get by on four hours of sleep, and mm -hmm. I'm not special. I'm stupid because sleep is critical. I was overweight. I was... I didn't care. I'm a double board certified psychiatrist, top neuroscience student in medical school, and I don't care about my own brain. I saw it and I cared. I have envy. I want my mom's brain. <laughs> and so I always say Freud was wrong. Penis envy is not the cause of anybody's problem. You need brain envy. You need to love your brain. And that's where brain health starts. It's like, oh, I have this organ that creates me. Let me love it. And then avoid things that hurt it. Just got to know the list and do things that help it. And again, you just have to know the list. And if we do the bright minds, it says what to avoid and what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those 11 sort of principles, right, that are built into that acronym. Yeah. They're everywhere in my head. Like B, for example, is for blood flow. Mm -hmm. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. So if you have it in your family and I scan you, we're going to look. I mean, SPACT is a study that looks at blood flow and mitochondrial activity. 49% of the tracer is taken up in the mitochondria. So we're going to look at blood flow and energy. And if it's low, we're going to go, why? You know, head traumas, drugs, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, not sleeping, having high blood pressure, being overweight. And we're going to target the reasons why it's low. And then we're going to do exercise increases blood flow. I love exercise. Ginkgo is one of my favorite supplements because... The best brands I ever see have taken ginkgo, oregano, cayenne pepper, beets, increase mm -hmm. blood flow. So know your risk factor and then know what to do. And the trick with exercise is coordination exercises. People who play racket sports live longer than everybody else. This is a replicated study on like 90,000 people. Because what coordination does is it activates your cerebellum, little brain, 10% of the brain's volume in the back is half the brain's neurons. And if you activate that, it turns on the rest. 
of your brain. So I'm a huge fan of table tennis and pickleball and tennis. It's bad news for me. I'm very athletic, but when it comes to anything involving eye-hand coordination, I'm terrible at it, and so I've avoided it my whole life. But that's good news for you if you can get over yourself. Because there's more more to be gained, right? Yeah, get a really good yeah. ping pong coach. And don't judge yourself. Just go and learn to be good. And don't have to beat people. If you spent a half an hour twice a week, It'll have a major impact on your ability to think because you got to get your eyes, hands, and feet all working together while you think about the spin on the ball. I think of it as aerobic chess. I have this thing, which I think might be fairly common, which is this idea that perhaps I'm past the point of no return. So let me explain. I was a competitive swimmer growing up. So between the ages of like 14 and 21, I was training, you know, four to five hours a day, waking up at 4.30 in the morning and walking around overtrained like a zombie. So I wasn't getting good sleep. I never felt rested. I always felt fatigued during that period of time. Alcohol became quite the thing around age 18 and from 18 to 31, a progression into alcoholism. And during that period of time, you know, maybe getting one good night of sleep while the rest of the nights were blackouts or recovering from blackouts, I get sober at 31, but from 31 to 40, I transfer a lot of that addictive energy into my lifestyle choices. So I was basically sedentary and subsisting on hot dogs, French fries, pizza, McDonald's jack-in-the-box while not exercising. At around 40, I have a come-to-Jesus moment. I change my lifestyle habits and, and many things about my life, and I'm a much healthier person now. I eat a plant-based diet. I'm very fit and active. I'm engaged mentally through the process of doing this podcast and other things that I do, uh, and my life is good, but I can't shake this sense that I have done so much damage over the course of my lifetime that no matter how many good things I do now, that at some point, I'm not going to be able to overcome that damage. It's going to catch up to me. And so what's the point in doubling down and really investing in all of the things that you're saying? And I, I, I think on some level, that might be common. People are thinking, well, I've, I've treated myself terribly. Oh, I think it's that song has been common, sung. So it's a lot. You know, mutability is your whole thing. Like we can't, but is there a period at which, I mean, I would suspect it's more difficult than it is for others, but what would you tell someone like myself or someone who's of a similar mindset or a similar type past history? Well, one, we should look, right? How do you know unless you look? And so many people go, oh, no, I don't want to know. Yeah, I'm scared. Like, if I'm, you, a little, it, I'm a little scared. If you knew a train was going to hit you, wouldn't you at least try to get out of the way? As long as there was a possibility to get out of the way. Of course If I is. couldn't get out of the way, just let it hit me, and I'm none the wiser. So I do a show. Actually, I want you to be on it. Scan my brain on YouTube and Instagram. And one of my favorite guys, Troy Gloss, 2002 World Series MVP, played third base for the Angels. Love him dearly. Drinking way too much, four concussions, depressed, suicidal. I mean, he was in a dark place, didn't think there was any hope. And I got him to do my show. I don't know how that happened. His brain was awful, like awful. But he did what I asked him to do. And his wife, uh, Anne, who I dearly love, she was a good partner. He stopped drinking, he ate better exercised, took the supplements, lost 15 pounds in two months. And I'm like, let's look again, because I could just tell he was better. His brain significantly better. In a two-month period. Two months. And then I scanned him 16 months later. How old is he? 47 now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were ups and downs, right? When you're an alcoholic, it does you just don't stop. I mean, some people do, but, you know, there was some bumps for mm -hmm. us. But, you know, we're in the fight together. And 16 months later, his brain is so good. 
And I know five years from now, if he continues on and he has brain envy, his brain's going to be freaking normal. You have a choice. But if you don't know, if you don't look, you don't know. And why would you ever be in that position? I want to know, which is why, you know, every couple of years I'll get a whole body scan because if trouble's coming, I want to get it early. I don't want to wait until Mm -hmm. late. So many of the lifestyle illnesses that we're seeing now are tracked to chronic inflammation. So what are some of the things that we can do to ameliorate that that have implications in terms of brain health? So in Bright Minds, the first eye is inflammation and some surprising things. It's like 98% of us have low levels of omega-3 fatty acids. If you're not taking an omega-3 supplement or focused on eating low mercury, high omega-3 fish, that's a problem because low omega-3 increases inflammation. If you're not a bit obsessed with your gums and your teeth, if you have gum disease, you're more likely to have brain disease and heart disease. And like, I didn't Just really- Just to drill down on that a little bit, it's always amazing to me that that doesn't get enough bandwidth in terms of our overall health. Because I know I've had periodontal disease and gum problems my whole life. And I was educated early about the implications of not treating that well because that tends to lead to arthrosclerotic issues and brain health obviously it's a circulatory situation it has to have implications in terms of brain health absolutely because your brain is two percent of your body's weight but uses 20 percent of the blood flow in your body 20 percent of the oxygen in your body goes to your brain and if you have gum disease infections in your gums periodontal issues, abscesses, and the like, how does that translate into circulatory issues? Like what is have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So it increases inflammation, which, you know, many people think is the mother of all illness. I don't know about that, but I don't want to have inflammation. And for a long time, I didn't really care about my own gums until study after study, gum disease, heart disease, gum disease, brain disease. I'm like, no, got to take care of my So become a flossing fool. In terms of blood work, what should people be paying attention to? I mean, you mentioned omega-3s, but if someone's doing a blood panel and they get the results, what are some things that would jump out to you? So if we look at some of the important numbers for Bright Minds, like blood pressure would be for blood flow, retirement and aging, you don't want high iron levels. Iron accelerates aging. You don't want low iron because that'll make you not sleep and be anxious. And I tend to accumulate iron, so I go donate blood twice a year, and that seems to help. Good for other people, good for me. For inflammation, you want to know your C-reactive protein. For genetics, you probably should know your ApoE4 gene type. I'm a 2-3. Is that the gene that's connected to that dementia, the, the Chris risk. Hemsworth situation yes. where he's he a, double, a double allele or whatever yeah 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 he's a e44 which means he has a tenfold risk but a tenfold risk means about 25 percent and so it just means be serious and exercise the kind of exercise you're doing decreases the risk if you have one or two E4 genes. Mm -hmm. For head trauma, it's just the number of head traumas you have. Toxins, how's your liver function? So liver function tests, mental health, it's your ACE score, adverse childhood experiences, zero to 10. How many do you have? My wife wrote a book called The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child. She's an eight Mm -hmm. out of 10. My nieces who I adopted are both nines. I mean, if you have four or more, it increases your risk of seven of the top 10 leading causes of death. If you have six or more, you die 20 years early. Now, my nieces and my wife aren't dying 20 years early because there are things you can do to extract the past trauma 
which is super important. The second I is immunity and infection. So know your vitamin D level and get it above 40. People who are above 40 have half the risk of cancer of those who are under 20. And when I first tested mine, when I sort of figured this out 20 years ago, I was 17. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how am I 17? Because I exercise, but I exercise at night because I'm working during the day. And I realized I need more sun and I need to supplement to have a healthy level, not too much but a healthy level. And then N is neurohormones, get them tested every year. We're living in a society where low testosterone levels are rampant in young males. And uh, I've just never seen anything quite like it. What is contributing to that? Head trauma and toxins. Are more young males having head trauma than they used to be? Well, with football and soccer and skateboarding, maybe. The other thing is toxins on their body, the products you put on their body. So I have all my patients download the app Think Dirty mm -hmm. and scan all of your personal products to is see that how EWG quickly. EWG thing? Like it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. similar to it. So for example, I used to shave with Barbasol 50 years. And on a scale of zero is live long, 10 is kill you early. It's a nine. And now I shave with something called Kiss My Face, which is a two. It's insane the extent to which uh, there are so many chemicals in our everyday products that we're unaware of and the lack of regulation on this. I've had plenty of guests in the past come on to talk about it. Ken Cook from EWG. My friend Darren Arlene wrote a book called Fatal Conveniences, and you read it. It's very solution-oriented, but it's quite an eye-opener to realize- It's so uh, disturbing. The amount of uh, toxicity in our personal care products and things that we sort of take for granted and assume are safe. And what happened during COVID? It's all of a sudden these toxic hand sanitizers that have parabens and phthalates and fragrance that are just bad for you. People are lathering themselves, their children, with this stuff, which is why I'm a fan of earth-friendly products because they make these cleaning products that I have no interest in them except I love them. You need to be thoughtful, you know, what you clean your clothes with, what deodorant you use, if, what sunscreen you use, read the label. And it's like, oh, well, I can't understand it. Then you need to, like, understand. Or get EWG or Think Dirty and just scan it. And it'll tell you good for your brain and body or bad for it. And it, people go, oh, but that's so expensive. I'm like, no, being sick is expensive. This is just about love. Why would you put something on your body or your child's body that is poison? You get your hormones checked and then your hemoglobin A1C, obviously, and your BMI. They're very important numbers to know. 72% of Americans are overweight, 42% are obese, it's the biggest brain drain in the history of the world. I published three studies that say as your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down. And I learned that connection. In 2009, Cyrus Raji from the University of Pittsburgh published an MRI study that if you're overweight, you have 4% less volume in your brain and your brain looks eight years older than healthy people. If you're obese, you have 8% less volume in your brain, and your brain looks 16 years older. And I have a normal database of scans, but we never, I mean, we ask them about weight, but we never wow. use that as an exclusion criteria. Healthy weight versus overweight or obese, significantly less blood flow. And then I did an NFL study, healthy weight NFL players, versus overweight NFL players love frontal lobe function. And I'm like, oh, no. And can you talk about it without somebody being mad at you? So I've had lots of people mad at me, but it's just science, right? I'm just making the connection. If you are overweight, of these 11 risk factors, you have seven 
of them wow. because it decreases blood flow, promotes aging, increases inflammation, changes healthy testosterone into unhealthy cancer-promoting forms of estrogen, and you got to get serious. Now, being underweight's bad for your brain. Being overweight's bad for your brain. You mentioned the importance of loving your brain, and I would imagine showing your patients these images, these scans, helps to create that connection because you see what's actually happening and perhaps that opens the door to loving your brain a little bit more. I think a lot about what the difference is between people who are able to absorb information and then make a change in their life versus people who absorb the same information and either choose not to or struggle to make that change or struggle to make that change last or sustain. Because if you have low self-esteem, if you are somebody who is of a negative disposition or just see the world through the lens of lack as opposed to opportunity, those people, I would suspect, are more difficult cases in terms of trying to get them excited about the possibility. If you don't love yourself, it's pretty hard to invest in, get that person to invest in healthier lifestyle habits. It's absolutely so there true. is a, it's a mental health thing as much as it is a rational, logical information thing. No question. And there are many people who had early childhood trauma, for example, who developed real rage about what happened, but then guilt about the rage because I still have to be with these people. They still house me and feed me. And so it goes unconscious. They start attacking themselves. And I'm bad. It's hard for me if I believe at my core I'm bad to do the right things out of love because you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is a brain problem because trauma gets stuck in your brain, but it's also a psychological problem. I think of all my patients in four big circles, it's what's the biology, which is brain health, why we got to look at your brain and those important numbers we talked about. How's your psychological health, right? It's, it's your mind. What's the quality of your thoughts, the level of the trauma you have? Uh, what's the chatter in your head? There's also a social circle. What's going on in your life now with your kids, with your spouse, with work? And there's a spiritual circle. So why the heck do you care? You know, what is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? And so in my mind, when I evaluate my patients, all four circles all the time, I want to have an exercise called the one page miracle. I want you to know what do you want? Relationships, work, money, physical, emotional, spiritual. What do you want? Let's define it so you can look at it on a regular basis. Are you noticing what you like about the other people in your life more than what you don't? And whenever you feel sad, mm -hmm. mad, nervous, or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And I have this great process, thinking in honest, accurate ways. So I'm not a huge fan of positive thinking. I'm a fan of accurate thinking with a positive spin. And that'd be worth chatting about. And then I'm going to get your brain healthy. So if I give you these strategies and you don't do it, I want to bond with you so you come back and trust me. And then I want to work on, you know, perhaps the past trauma. I love a therapy called EMDR, Specific Psychological Treatment for Trauma. It stands for eye movement desensitization mm -hmm. and reprocessing. And I love another one called ISTDP, Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Therapy. And the foundation of that therapy is people really struggling they like won't do the things they could do to be healthy it's attachment problems that led to rage and then guilt about the rage and self-attack it's like they're living that i did something wrong even though everybody's done things mm -hmm. wrong and 
you know, most people forgive themselves. They're living with this self-attack. And that takes sometimes intense therapy, but it doesn't have to be long. That's why they call it intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy. And you've had success with that, great success with that? Yes. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, because you can show that person as, not, as many scans as you want, but until you untie that knot and get to the root of what's driving that you know, disposition that's preventing them from making changes, it, it's not going to matter. I've never seen anything as powerful as showing somebody their brain, like with addiction. Mm. When I first started ordering scans, I was the director of a dual diagnosis unit, so a psychiatric hospital unit that takes care of substance abusers. Their brains were so bad. <laughs> and I was like, here's a healthy brain, here's your brain. Your brain controls everything you do. Which brain do you want? I mean, I think anybody with an addiction should get their brain scanned. And I came up with, I wrote a book, with uh, David Smith called Unchain Your Brain, Breaking the Addictions That Steal Your Life. And like giving everybody Prozac's insane, right? There are many different ways to get depressed. Give everybody a 12-step program. It's a bit insane because they're impulsive addicts. They're compulsive addicts. They're impulsive compulsive addicts. They're sad addicts. They're head trauma addicts. It's like, no, the type you had. And if somebody diagnosed you with ADD, which we will talk about, well, that's our impulsive addicts group. It's like mm. you want to do the right things, but you just don't have enough of a break to stop. And that could go with low frontal lobe activity. Our compulsive addicts, they just get the same thought in their head over and over again. And sometimes clinically, it's hard to tell the difference because they go, oh, I'm impulsive. But what they really mean is they're compulsive. So they get a thought. The impulsive person gets a thought and does it without thinking. The compulsive person gets a thought over and over again and has to do it. And so one is a dopamine intervention, the other is a serotonin intervention. And how would you know unless you really looked? Interesting. <laughs>